Zhuangzi, a uh, I don't, I don't like saying secondary work, uh, but it is drawn from uh, the, the, uh, a more primary work. Um, it, is a, it, is the, it is the second most, again, you, you, there's an unavoidable hierarchy there, uh, the second most prominent text of the ancient belief of Taoism in uh, in ancient China, and the the, the primaries of uh, ancient Chinese thought are complicated, but easily not not easily, but uh, but discernible. Uh, number one would be Confucianism. This came around a figure named Confucius supposedly, and again, uh, kind of like Homer, you can't take the individuals particularly seriously in this. Uh, they're kind of irrelevant. Supposedly, this figure comes about um, in a time of great political turbulence in ancient China, uh, an, an era known as the Warring States era, which gives you an idea of what political turbulence looked like. Um, the uh, the principles of it, of, of, uh, of Confucius and Confucianism that stem from his writings, um, and that, you know, he maybe wrote some of and then his disciples wrote, we don't know, we don't, I don't care. Uh, the principles of those are about learning to get along, about having a functioning society. As it says up there, Confucianism is largely external and behavioral. It is about what people do in society, how they're supposed to act with one another. The, uh, the purpose of it is to have a smoothly running um, government and civilization following a time where you didn't really have either of those things. But by codifying in very nuanced and subjective ways at times, by codifying the roles of, uh, of humanity, by codifying what people are supposed to do, how they are supposed to act, how they are supposed to behave, hopefully then you have a smoothly functioning well-engineered society. Uh, the problem with that is, well, it's familiar to anybody who watches uh, science fiction. Uh, quite frankly, you soon get a very mechanistic society that doesn't care about individuals, just cares that they're all following the rules. And it becomes very rigid and ultimately kind of hollow as an experience. There is no uh, attention at all, concern in the slightest for, you know, what's going on on the inside. Are you satisfied? Are you fulfilled? Do you feel like you are reaching your full potential in life? All those questions, Confucianism just doesn't care. Confucianism is about uh, doing what you're supposed to do, and if you have problems, keep them to yourself. You know, you can make an argument that that system works on a large scale, especially, uh, but it does leave people feeling perhaps uh, a little depersonalized, a little alienated. Uh, a figure named Lao Tzu, again, probably, uh, probably legendary, uh, a made-up person, I don't care, comes along and writes a book called the Tao Te Ching. And this is a nice compliment to Confucianism. It is largely uh, an answer to Confucianism 
towards the same end. Uh, whereas Confucianism is external, Taoism is internal. It addresses the individual soul, if you will, the individual identity, which is a much more loaded term with Taoism, but I'm going to go there. And instead of being behavioral, where it's all about what you're doing outside yourself, uh, it is much more natural, which is about attuning yourself to the laws of nature around you. Uh, Zhuangzi comes in as a development out of Taoism. Uh, and individualizes himself, again, probably a legendary figure, uh, but the movement individualizes itself from the larger Taoism in that uh, it rejects, uh, it largely rejects, and again, all this is wildly debatable, it largely de de rejects the, uh, the controlling goal of social stability. Confucianism wanted everybody to perform certain roles in society and be content with that. Do your job, go to bed at night, get up in the morning, do your job, and then go to bed at night, and then that's it. <sighs> Lao Tse and Taoism uh, takes a different tack, but towards essentially the same end. If Confucianism is about letting all the power structures exist and you finding your place within that function and helping to support it by doing your job, well then, Taoism is about saying, you know, all that politics stuff, it just doesn't matter. Ignore it. But do your job. Just, you know, don't get upset about it. Don't worry about it. Just essentially phone it in. Uh, the great image of uh, the Tao Te Ching, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, the, the, the metaphor of the bending reed. A reed in a river that stands firm will break under the force of the river. But a reed that bends stays whole and will continue to live in the force of the river. And that's very poetic and very beautiful. And I can just imagine a nice swiftly flowing stream and all these reeds bending under the, the force of the water. And it's very poetic and beautiful. But now that's not just that's not just for a nice little image of a water. Imagine that as uh, a political metaphor. If you stand up for yourself rigidly, uh, you break. But if you just go with the flow, just don't fight it. You bend to the prevailing force and everything works fine. So both Taoism under Lao Tse and Confucianism are about society functioning over all else at the expense largely of uh, the individual soul, to use another loaded term. Zhuangzi dispenses with even that, however. Taoism, but looking at government itself and making fun of it and saying uh, it is stupid. It is corrupt. It is intellectually bankrupt. 
the uh, because of that, this can be a lot more fun to read than any of the other stuff. Confucius can be uh, a little, uh, little, you know, inflexible, a little frustrating. The stern schoolmarm staring at you and telling you to eat your vegetables all the time. Um, Lao Tse, much more poetic, much more uh, attuned to what's going on inside of you. And that's nice. But it can also be you know, madly uh, opaque, confusing. And that's frustrating. Zhuangzi has a sense of humor. Zhuangzi tells stories, little parables that uh, capture the essence of the idea that he's trying to communicate without telling you, this is what you should do. But also with that basic human uh, a basic human instinct for human nature and humanity as part of nature that I think distinguishes it from both the two poles that came before it. The, uh, the work we have from him is uh, fun. The, uh, the very first chapter of Zhuangzi, named after the, you know, reputed author, uh, is titled, what? Free and easy wandering. Free and easy wandering. Yeah. Uh, Zhuangzi is very big with, uh, you know, uh, hippies and countercultural stuff. Uh, but automatically that sort of sets up, all right, that should be sort of fun. And that's just the title of chapter one, but it can be broadly interpreted as kind of the whole thing. You are wandering around the world. Free and easy. It's relaxing. It's enjoyable. It's a kind of journey, but it's not a journey that's so focused on the end point. Like Odysseus was focused on the end point of reaching Ithaca. This is just, you know, meandering along and saying, ooh, look at that. It's a much more open, relaxing, enjoyable um, ride, quite frankly. You get a repeated focus on seemingly insignificant beings effectively trumping big powerful ones. And you can view this on many levels, but I would encourage everybody to think of it metaphorically. Therefore, a man who has wisdom enough to fill one office effectively, good conduct enough to impress one community, virtue enough to please one ruler, or talent enough to be called into service in one state, has the same kind of self-pride as these little creatures. Song Ranji could certainly burst, would certainly burst out laughing at such a man. The whole world would, play, would praise Song Ranji, and it wouldn't make him exert himself. The whole world could condemn him, and it wouldn't make him mope. He drew a clear line between the internal and the external and recognized the boundaries of true glory and disgrace, but that was all. As far as the world went, he didn't fret and worry, but there was still ground he left unturned. What are the values being expressed here? What's he making fun of? What's he commenting on? There is that curious focus immediately. The wisdom to fill one office effectively. So there is a political element here. That's what he's talking about there. 
government. Good conduct enough to impress one community, virtue enough to please one ruler. But it's also that re repetition of one, one, one. It's starting to feel narrow. Has the same kind of self pride. Self pride. Do you think that's a compliment? No, I don't think so. There's a constant critique of society and the impulse to uh, the impulse to value strength and size and rigidity over the more soft characteristics of humanity. Remember that this whole chapter begins with this story of this enormous fish who then transforms into an enormous bird. Whenever you see size in Zhuangzi, you got to look at it a little. Hmm. Size matters in this. The obsession with size, with grandeur, with stature is almost always a point of ridicule. Because who has the most stature and grandeur and size? Well, the emperor, various important people, large immovable social structures that are starting to crop up in civilization. And here, Zhuangzi, the, crit the critic and the, t and the text itself, is saying, well, be suspicious of them. So, like we saw in that one little passage I read, this is criticizing government itself. This is criticizing the values attendant upon uh, empire. Now, this is coming a little after the period of Confucius and even Lao Tse, who were arguably closer to the chaos of barbarism and civil war and strife and all of that, and who, as government advisors themselves, Confucius was, by legend, a traveling scholar loaning out his advice or his, uh, his ability to advise to local, uh, local leaders. They're trying to create peace, Confucius and his generation, and ultimately Lao Tse. Here, Zhuangzi is saying, you know, that peace comes at a cost. Now, you can say, well, Zhuangzi is growing up in a period of relative peace, established by these more authoritarian structures. But you can see that basic rhythm throughout history in all civilizations, quite frankly, where people who go through tumultuous times tend to really gravitate towards order. And people who grow up in order eh, want to loosen it up a little. And that back and forth exists as a constant conversation throughout history. Question. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I have a comment about what you said. Uh, I believe that to be peace, there has to be war first. That there could not exist peace if there was not a struggle before it. Mm -hmm. I say if it was like normal, nothing happened, 
there's no peace. It's just people then doesn't realize why it's happening. I believe that mm-hmm. it has to be they have to be a figure of authority to bring peace. Because if you don't know, I don't know, nothing happens, right? But if you know something's bad and we fix it, you already know that it's bad, so it's not going to happen again. Mm-hmm. You close that door of happening again. But if we both don't know, it could happen, and it can, if it happens and it doesn't get fixed, it's, it's going to repeat itself. Yeah. Repeat itself. So I feel that to be able to be peace, there have to be war. And uh, what you said early about the way of Taoism, it is, I feel that they're trying to promote their own way, like they don't have ambition. You know, because when you have ambitions, you don't think about, oh, cool and all that stuff. No, because to be able to achieve, you have to like uh, be a warrior. Say, you okay. Know, if you like, you know, chill, relax, and like, everything's happy, everything's cool, you don't move. Okay? Yeah. You know, it's, okay, it's cool, but the world moves faster than you. Right? Yeah. So if you live in, oh, everything's cool, the other person who actually, you know, has a wire himself at the end is going to outwork you, and then at the end, it's going to, like, you know, they say, be bigger than you. And it's not that bad words, it's just that how a word is. Yeah. A couple of things in that. One, um, I'm intrigued, and we'll get back to the way you are saying that, well, it's hard to be, uh, uh, it's hard to have peace without an understanding of war. Uh, Because peace and war are both words. And we're going to talk about words a little bit later and how you can't really understand what peace is as a word unless you understand what war is as its opposite. And it's hard to really imagine one thing independent of its contrast. That's how the mind tends to work. Uh, But that's very interesting. The notion of having that kind of mixed reality where where you are aware of something because it is also uh, in some way embracing its opposite is in that little figure I have behind me in kind of faint pinkish hue. That's a common symbol of, uh, of, well, Zen Buddhism, but the parallels between that and Taoism are really quite strong and other scholars can draw an awful lot of lines between them where you see a whole that is essentially divided in half, but elements of each half are within the other half. You cannot have something that is entirely one thing without it being part of another. Uh, That is a core element within this. The the final point I would I, I'd like to make is what you're saying about the um, <clears throat> uh, about the those the tendencies of society itself. I it, maybe I was wrong, but uh, you seem to be saying that um, it, you seem to be saying that in order for uh, peace to be successful. people within a time of peace need to understand the context of uh, its opposite of war. And that without that engine of we don't want to go back there, uh, we will never get, as you put it, I believe, we will never move forward. Right? Yeah. Okay. That is a progressivist, SAT word, progressivist uh, way of looking at the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you are saying that, okay, we can learn, we can get better, we just need to move through and incorporate more information, and ultimately we will improve. We make progress. This is less about that. Progress itself, in that way, 
is a, is a much more westernized way of thinking. So here, we're, we're, in a, uh, we're in a mode of thinking where the goal, if there is one, uh, is to become one with nature, as the bumper sticker tends to have it. But what is the goal of nature? There is none. The nature of nature is nature itself. You have no end point. You just exist. The idea of progressivism, the idea of getting better, is uh, self-pride. Um, you're not going to get any better. I'm certainly not going to get any better. I'm probably going to get a little worse, to be perfectly honest, but you know. But we're not, we're not going to progress, we're just going to be. And the only goal of Taoism, largely, is an emptying out of oneself. And here we're getting very yogic, quite frankly. But an emptying out of oneself so that you let go of that progressive nature, which is so ego-driven, and you just become one with nature. You embrace nature to such a degree that yourself disappears. Question? stuff, uh, it, it's often very difficult to get your head wrapped around it. Um, but understanding how much of it is um, a function of the way we naturally think and the way we naturally learn, uh, especially here in the West, as we will say, uh, is we tend to... Uh, we tend to think in a much more progressive way to begin with, where there is an answer to get to. And, you know, particularly like if, you know, uh, those of you like math majors or something, you want to you want to get through the problem and then find, OK, there's an answer at the end. It's simple. It's yeah. Uh, that is less certain in this realm. And even just, you know, think about the way I started this where I started saying, okay, I'm going to start by talking about Zhuangzi, but I'm going to start that by not talking about Zhuangzi. I'm going to talk about the contrasts, because the contrasts make it easier to see the center, the focus. And, well, that's kind of oppositional, and that's kind of weird, and it's endemic to how I can process information, uh, it's endemic to how I think most people in the West can process information, so that's how I'm trying to function with it. But it is a very different way of thinking. And yeah, there are problems within that that are very difficult to pursue uh, or get a sense of because of our limitations of how we think, but that doesn't invalidate these other perspectives, these other ways of thinking, and in fact, 
taking that ride and just saying, okay, what if I just try and put aside my Western way of thinking and I'll go much more wholeheartedly and try this way. And again, you can say uh, arguments would be made in Taoism especially that to try is, uh, is itself progressivist. I'm starting to sound like Yoda, quite frankly. But Yoda very uh, specifically is written to espouse this very ideology. And I can go off on Star Wars and, and George Lucas and his love of uh, Eastern uh, philosophy for quite a while, but I won't. But by embracing these other ways of thinking, they tend to strengthen our primary ways of thinking, broaden our perspectives, and just make us more open, smart people. In the bald and barren north, there is a dark sea, the lake of heaven. In it is a fish which is several thousand li across. No one knows how long. His name is Kun. There is also a bird there named Peng with a back like Mount Tai and wings like clouds filling the sky. He beats the whirlwind, leaps into the air and rises up 90,000 li, cutting through the clouds and mist, shouldering the blue skies. And then he turns his eyes south and prepares to journey to the southern darkness. We're a couple of paragraphs in. We're getting the same information about this bird, this giant bird. And we're reading it again. When you stumble across that in the text, did you have to wonder, huh? What? I know that. Somebody, somebody screwed up in the editing of this. Clearly, they should have red penciled that out of there because the, uh, we already had that information. Yes, the bird is big. I get it. I get it. I get it. What's next? What's next? But instead, the text repeats itself. Mocking, you might say, the idea of progress. You are impatient for progress. All right, I get it, the bird. What happens to the bird? Where's the plot? But the text is throwing out these little hints. And you know, when, when that crops up, you're allowed to say, you know, huh? What? Because progress is an illusion. And you need to let go of that. And the text is toying with you a little. Perhaps, you know, yanking your chain a little bit, maybe even irritating you. But if you just go with that and say, oh, okay, it's, it's having a little fun. I read through the bit about the bird, then I got through some other stuff, and that was pretty good. Uh, and now I'm right back at the bird. Oh, I guess we're all just taking a ride. When you go on a roller coaster, you tend to start at one place, go through all sorts of twists and turns and ups and downs and loop-de-loops and all this stuff. And if you're really lucky, you don't throw up in the middle, but then you come right back to where? Exactly where you got off. Progress is an illusion. And then of course, the first line after that repetition of how big the bird was, the first line of the next paragraph, the little quail laughs at him. So this enormous bird, is coming in for scorn from something tiny and frail, perhaps insignificant. Again and again and again, you see this mockery of the big and the powerful, the people who think they know something when they are exposed to be just wrong on many occasions. There are, throughout, there are a series of little dialogues. The dialogue, I think, itself is significant. Uh, if you read Confucius's Analects, they are told largely in dialogue form. It is social. It is two people talking. And, and that I find significant for the social behavioral uh, outlook of Confucianism. In, the Tao Te Ching, you tend to not get dialogue. There are no characters. It's just one mind speaking to you. But it is not social. It is not constructed of different people talking one another. But here we get dialogue, little dialogue passages. And very frequently, it will be between a figure named Hui Zi, who is a... Uh, I believe he is a real historical figure. He was a uh, philosopher. 
He was a logician, somebody expert in logic, in making progressive, deductive arguments about stuff. And he also served in politics. So you can see how while there is a clearly friendly relationship between the character of Zhuangzi and the character of Huizi, the logician, uh, Huizi comes in for a fair amount of uh, ridicule. He always seems to be wrong about everything. And in that, you get, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Plato's dialogues, you get a nice little uh, analog to the repeated uh, example of Platonic dialogues where the figure of Socrates just goes around and says, well, I don't really know anything, but I'm going to go and find the smartest people I hear around, and I'm going to ask them some questions and try and figure out what makes them so smart and how can I be smart like them. And so he walks up to one pompous jackass after another and asks him a series of very uh, seemingly obvious but remarkably complicated questions that expose the smart, important, very rigid, proud authority on this, that, and the other thing, and points out that actually he knows absolutely nothing at all. Same dynamic running through here. Uh, that same impulse to question authority, to undermine traditional ideas that just get handed down to us and we take for granted without ever really thinking about them, you know? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why does this have to be that way? Why can't it be another way? Wouldn't that be better? Uh, the revolutionary implications of this line of thought, I think, are pretty obvious. And this is why Zhuangzi is not working in the same lane as Lao Tse. Lao Tse says, well, just go along with the system. Don't fight it. Just, you know, go with the flow. Zhuangzi says, nah, stand outside the flow. And when possible, pee in the flow. It's funny that way. Um, one of the authorities, one of the traditions that he tends to uh, ridicule is the reliance on language itself, on words. How do we know what we know? How do we mean what we say? And there are continuous references to, um, well, language. Huizi said to Zhuangzi, I have a big tree of the kind men call shu. Its trunk is too gnarled and bumpy to apply a measuring line to its branches, too bent and twisty to match up to a compass or square. You could stand it by the road and no carpenter would look at it twice. Your words, too, are big and useless, and so everybody alike spurns them. So Huizi is using uh, this metaphor of a tree. Metaphor is a construction of words meant to convey an idea. You talk about one thing through words and your listener says it's not that one thing, it represents something much larger. Kind of a complicated notion. Uh, Zhuangzi replies, maybe you've never seen a wildcat or a weasel. It crouches down and hides, watching for something to come along. It leaps and races east and west, not hesitating to go high or low until it falls into the trap and dies in the net. Then again, there's the yak 
big as a cloud covering the sky. It certainly knows how to be big, though it doesn't know how to catch rats. Now you have this big tree and you're distressed because it's useless. Why don't you plant it in not any, not even anything village or the field down broad and boundless? Relax, relax and do nothing by its side or lie down for a free and easy sleep under it? Axes will never shorten its life. Nothing can ever harm it. There is no use for it. How can it come to grief or pain? Now, that is odd and elliptical and a little confusing. And I can easily forgive anybody who just reads that and says, okay. But a couple of points. One, uh, he's attacking his friend Queasy here. Uh, poor Queasy, you know, he, he, he gets a rough, uh, a rough ride of it. Um, <laughs> repeated references to the word big. This pops up. And think again about how we began with a big bird. Size. Not all it's cracked up to be. The Wheezy seems concerned with the size of the tree. Zhuang Zi does not. Zhuang Zi says, you know, it's it's a tree. It's got different uses. Use it for what you want, or don't use it at all. Queasy is progressive. He wants to find a purpose. He wants to find a use. It has to, this is a tree. It needs to be used for something down the line. So Wang Zi says, no. But in that, you can hear all of this, this fun speech, quite frankly, that he throws out there when he's making fun a little bit of Queasy. And I would point out that Tweezy is a logician, somebody who is working in logic, somebody who is working in words. If this, then that kind of logic. Uh, Zhuangzi is turning that around at him. And the fun of the language is easy to get wrapped up in. Then again, there's the yak, big as a cloud and covering the sky. It certainly knows how to be big, though it doesn't know how to catch rats. Like, okay. And now I'm just imagining this big image, this big metaphor of a yak. And I'm spinning out the meanings from that. What could it mean? What could it symbolize? What is it conveying to me? And I'm betting that if I'm hearing this in the original language, it would be sort of fun and bouncy too because it is enveloping everything and it is making use of what to do this? Words. We're reading words. Question, comment. I have a question. So is he comparing the jam like to the echo or how like it's big but it doesn't do like a lot of, it doesn't have the well, that could be an interpretation, but put yourself in the shoes of a, uh, you know, freelance philosopher of the ancient era. If you were to say that, yeah, the emperor is big, but he's worthless and ultimately kind of evil, what would happen to you? You say that to the emperor, you could get killed. Yeah, but if you just say, no, I'm just writing about a yak. It's convenient. You can make the point in metaphor. I'm not talking about that water bottle, but that water bottle symbolizes something much bigger. The so water bottle is empty and hard and a little expensive. What could that be? And if anybody comes knocking at your door and says, yeah, I see you wrote this about uh, the emperor, or at least 
this seems like a metaphor for the emperor. You could say, I didn't even get that. That's, that's, that's a totally different interpretation. You are taking my words and incorporating a different meaning for them, and they are very different. But once you admit that, that words don't necessarily mean what they seem to mean, where do you go with that? Zeke says, the great clod belches out breath and its name is wind so long as it doesn't come forth, nothing happens. But when it does, then 10,000 hollows begin crying wildly. Can't you hear them long drawn out in the mountain's forest that lash and sway? There are huge trees a hundred spans around with hollows and openings like noses and mouths, like ears, like jugs, like cups, like mortars, like rifts, like ruts. They roar like waves, whistle like arrows, screech, crash, cry, wail, moan, and howl. Those in the lead calling out, yee! Those behind calling out, you! In the gentle breeze, they answer faintly, but in a full gale, the chorus is gigantic. And when the fierce wind has passed on, then all the hollows are empty again. Have you never seen the tossing and trembling that goes on? Now again, without any connection to anything else, just look at those words, and you can hear the kind of poetic sweep of that language. It is engrossing. It is dramatic. It is made up of little chunks of nature as well. It's keying in on nature. Nature is a big thing. But the words themselves and the sound of the words, the alliteration, the rhyming that is happening. This is a matter of translation, but I'm betting we can find the same in the original. The sound has an effect. It is conveying meaning above and beyond what the words themselves in a dictionary definition might be. The fish trap exists because of the fish. Once you have the fish, you can't forget the trap. Words exist because of meaning. Once you've gotten the meaning, you can forget the words. Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so that I can have a word with him? A uh, couple things on this. Um, talking about, very explicitly, I would say, the distance between uh, words and meaning. Uh, words are handed down to us. Language is something we learn. Language is human-made and culturally transmitted. We grow up into it. The words don't necessarily mean anything independent of that. Anybody who knows more than one language, as many of you do, recognizes that. The words are all kind of silly. But you know what you mean independent of them. If you get rid of language and you just put your faith in the truth of that language, well, that sounds really good, and there's a good argument to be made about that in terms of uh, cultural inheritance in general. What happens to the rule of law? How do you, how do you have rule of law if language doesn't really mean anything? The king can just come along and say, you know, I read the law. And yada, 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 this is what I think it means, so this is what we're going with. That's been a conflict for a long, long time. Can words have any meaning? There is a huge debate in the Supreme Court between people who, uh, conservative justices, um, are really basing a lot of their, uh, their interpretations of law on a so-called theory of originalism. What did the words mean? Not only in a dictionary definition right now, but what did the words mean to the people who wrote them to begin with? So you get somebody like 
the former, now dead, uh, um, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, who would go back and he kept in his office a dictionary of the English language available in uh, 1789 when the Constitution was drafted, or 1787. Uh, and he would point to, okay, yes, that word means something, but it means something to us that is very different than what it meant then. So if we are going to stick to the word, to the rule of law, we need to abide by what the meaning was then, because that is fixed, that is immovable. But if you start talking about evolution, about change, about bending with the river instead of standing firm, then... Uh, the rule of law is very slippery. And it becomes just a matter of, well, this is what I think the words mean. And that has its own dangers. The specifics of this one element of the fish trap, another natural image, basing the communication in a metaphor a poetic structure, if you will, based on nature. We can all return to nature for a kind of universal understanding of meaning. The, uh, the idea that the words themselves are dispensable. Once you have the fish, you don't need the trap. The trap is the language. The fish is the idea. Once you have the idea, you can dispel with the language. Once you have the truth, you can get rid of how you learned it. Hmm. When you start taking that metaphor and exploding it into larger contexts, it starts to take on, well, revolutionary ideas. Because if culture and civilization is what brings you these ideas, are you free to dispense with the culture and, and civilization? And here's another word, government, that brought it to you. What is our responsibility to or obligation to tradition? to the established civilization that delivered us into time as we are. Consider as well that last line, which I just love. Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so that I can have a word with him? I don't know about you, but uh, I can't read that line without hearing it in the in the in, in in the voice of Groucho Marx. And those of you who aren't familiar with Groucho Marx, shame on you! Groucho Marx, one of the greatest uh, developments in Western civilization since the dawn of time. But anyway, very funny guy. Where can I? Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so that I can have a word with him? Uh, what does that do? He has brought you through this argument in this few very tight lines about the absurdity of language and the absurdity of clinging to the idea that words mean what they mean. But then at the end, he kind of mocks that. He undercuts his own argument by making it a joke. Where can I find the man who has forgotten words so that I can have a word with him? And even that phrasing, so that I can have a word with him. To have a word with someone generally means to have a short conversation. But the literal meaning of to have a word with someone is for the two of you to share a single word. It's absurd when you think of it that way and you say, well, it's just an expression. Yeah, language is often made up of expressions, little colloquialisms, little sayings, little cliches that we all lean on to make ourselves understood. But in this context, I think we can see 
it's made absurd. How can we have a word with someone when it would take so many words to explain this? But no, that one word is symbolizing something. It is a metaphor. It is a poetic construction. It's a cliche. But then we're back in the realm of language again, and cliches, metaphors, represent, uh, represent, representative language of all kinds are just about using a certain word on the, or a certain structure of language on the understanding that you will attribute more meaning to it than the literal word itself. It's not the thing, it's what the thing suggests to you. So the thing becomes, like the fish trap, irrelevant. Get rid of it. But we're always caught within it because we can't. Because we have to have a word with the man who has forgotten words. There is no way out. We're always trapped within language, even as we're trying to objectify it and say, well, this is how it is limiting me but I'm outside of it. I can objectify it. No, I can't because I'm explaining myself in language. I'm caught within it. It's a very subtle, fine point that is being made here. And it's not necessarily exclusive uh, to Zhuangzi throughout history. There's a whole school of uh, philosophy that develops out of this basic idea. Uh, but you see that repeated distrust of anything inherited, anything traditional, anything big and powerful that we all just assume, well, yes, OK, language. A word means what, it, what a word means. We can. We can feel solid about that. We can feel confident in that. But that very confidence is undermined because we're not supposed to feel confident in anything like that. We can only feel confident in the contrasts, in the ebb and flow, in one thing and not the other, but the other always having the one thing within it. And by dwelling on these things, by dwelling on these irresolvable conflicts, um, you ultimately do what the text is advocating you do explicitly, which is to induce a kind of almost zen-like, and I'm using that word very advisedly, trance-like state. You are emptying yourself out of your preconceived notions. If you start to dwell on, well, how can I say something without using language? How can I think something without using language? Can I think something without using language? If I can think something but I can't say it, how can I communicate that? Does it matter if I can communicate it, if I have already thought it? All of those ideas start to collapse in on themselves. All of those ideas start to get lost in a fold that is irresolvable. But by dwelling in that space mentally and considering it, you start to become the reed that goes with the flow. Because you're letting go of your preconceived notions. You are bending to nature itself in a kind of illogical, anti-progressive, uh, organic unity, which sounds absurd and pompous. But again, I am trapped in language in trying to express this stuff. But by repeating this stuff and dwelling upon it, you are slowly receding into it. And so the job of, let's say, a monk, if we could say that a monk, a Taoist monk in this case, can have a goal and have a progressive goal, is to empty himself out by reading this stuff and dwelling on it 
and thinking about these things over and over again and reaching one conclusion only to realize that that un uh, conclusion is undercut by this other conclusion and there is no firm way to get a hold on anything so that you are all just swept away. And when you are swept away, you have given up on self-pride, you've given up on self-foundation, you've given up on self. And when you have achieved that, that's everything. The person who has emptied all notion of self out of himself is then filled or infused with a natural spirit, if you will, that is not progressive, that has no end goal, but that is just an expression of existence. And everything in this text is driving you to that point. One little story after another little story, pointing out different absurdities in life, different contradictions in life. Some of them are very charming, some of them drag you through and you're not sure how to take any of them. But they're all trying to get you to that same point of just saying, I don't know what to believe, but the what doesn't matter. I'm just going to be and not believe in anything external to me. Not external like, you know, a deity who is up in the clouds watching over me. Not external like a political system that is monitoring where I go and what I do. Not external that is a external validation saying you're good because I can see how you are behaving. And you are doing so as someone that uh, I would design the whole outward system for. You function within it. Not as an individual, but as a, uh, a component. Um, <clears throat> once you can slip into that mode of being, you are, uh, you are contradictorily uh, achieving something. You have progressed. But the mental state is what matters. Consider, where is it, page 1382. There's a uh, story, a little anecdote um, about a dream. Once Zhuang Zhao dreamt he was a butterfly, a butterfly flitting and fluttering around, happy with himself and doing as he pleased. He didn't know he was Zhuang Zhao. Suddenly he woke up and there he was, solid and unmistakable, Zhuang Zhao. But he didn't know if he was Zhuang Zhao who had, been, who had dreamt he was a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming he was Zhuang Zhao. Between Zhuang Zhao and a butterfly, there must be some distinction. This is called the transformation of things. Now, this is the sort of thing that, you know, is not... It's not difficult to sort of laugh at a little, you know, am I having a dream about this one thing or is this one thing having a dream about me? It's the sort of thing that people say when they're stoned, quite frankly. Uh, these little puzzles that, you know, they'll stare into a light bulb and wander about. Uh, but the idea of it, of looking at reality in one way and then embracing it as its opposite as well and admitting that it could be either one or both or neither uh, and refusing to get tied down to one interpretation of belief uh, that is kind of the point um, the rigidity of there must be some distinction with that exclamation point there and in this, uh, in this text, the, uh, the, the italicized some. There must be some distinction. 
because we want distinction, right? We want to be able to tell one thing from the other. That's how we understand anything in contradistinction to something else. But that's not what this text is driving at. This is called the transformation of things. Throughout these little anecdotes, throughout these little parables, you see transformations. You see a kind of progress, not necessarily linear, not necessarily towards a goal, but you see things change. You can be forgiven if some of you get a little confused in reading some of these little stories where suddenly you're reading about one little group of characters and events and then it just suddenly is talking about another group of characters and events and they don't seem to have any connection. And you go back and you look and say, well, maybe there was a line skip there or something, or maybe there's like a chapter heading or a subsetting or something like that. Maybe a little asterisk in between to separate things, because that, that must be a problem of the editing, right? They're putting one thing next to the other when they're two very distinct things. Not necessarily. One story flows into another because there is no distinction. One thing is part of the other. There is no such thing as one thing and the other. It is all interwoven. That is nature. And it is humanity that comes along and says, nope, that is a tree. That is a bush. That is a kitty cat. That is a dog. That specific specificity is a human structure of how we imagine things imposed on nature. It is not part of nature itself. The um, the the final chapter excerpts that we have here um, are, I think, a lot of fun. Again, always look at uh, beginnings and endings. In the, uh, in the original text, it's not that long, quite frankly. In the original text, there are, I think, 33 or 34 chapters. The first seven are assumed to be written by the figure of Zhuangzi himself. And then the remainder um, added to it over time by disciples. Uh, so here, if we're in the 20s and 30s, we are deeply into the disciples record uh, but it's uh, there they maintain that sense of fun the same basic characteristics of being um, uh, a little revolutionary a little uh, scandalous perhaps um, but always towards a uh, towards a purpose um, also from chapter 26, which is where we get the, uh, the fish trap story, we get traditionalists break into tombs using the poems and ceremony. The poems are the, uh, the, the classic of poetry, a compendium of poems based on Confucian teachings. Uh, traditionalists we can read as Confucianists themselves. Uh, the chief traditionalist deigned to convey these words, it beginneth to grow light in the east, how, how is it going? The subordinate traditionalist responded, I haven't got the skirt and jacket off yet, but there's a pearl in its mouth. The high traditionalist said, the high traditionalist, verily it is even as the poems say. Green, green groweth grain upon the slopes of the mound. The man ungenerous alive, in death his mouth will hold no pearl. I'll grab the whiskers and pull down the beard. You take the metal bar, break through his cheeks, and slowly part his jaws, but don't damage the pearl in his mouth. Huh? What? What the hell is going on there? Now, this is an excerpt, and you can be forgiven for saying, well, clearly they're just taking too little out of there. There must be a lot else in that chapter that really sets up and explains this. 
But just look at what we have here. We can get an awful lot out of there. Traditionalists! The very first word, beginnings and endings. Traditionalists! Uh, that sets in mind a whole lot of things. Could be just about anyone. Now, I am saying that this is probably Confucianism. But if you were a Confucianist prone to take offense at these things, and perhaps one with some power, like many traditionalists in ancient China were, uh, plausible deniability. No, that doesn't mean Confucianists. No, that's, that's something else entirely. You misunderstood me. Traditionalists break into tombs using the poems and ceremony. Now, again, we don't have to know an awful lot about the context here. Uh, is it favorable? Is your impression positive when you read that somebody breaks into tombs? Now, aside from Indiana Jones, that is generally not something nice people do. So right there, it's developing how you're supposed to view traditionalists using the poems and ceremony now I told you what the poems are but you don't really have to know anything about that uh, using literature and culture and ceremony like religious ceremony uh, political ceremony the pomp and circumstance that every large empire or government likes to couch itself in Think in terms of we're going to see a coronation of King Charles in the not too distant future. That will have a lot of pomp and ceremony where you're impressed and say, wow, he must be really powerful because that's a lot of cool stuff going on there. Who would I be to question that kind of power? Traditionalists break into tombs using the poems and ceremony. Hmm, using culture, basing their authority for tradition upon culture. Hmm. The chief traditionalist, again, I'm going to interpret that as Confucius, but plausibly deniable for anyone. Uh, the chief traditionalist deigned to convey these words. What does deigned mean? SAT word. Deigned. Basically, he lowered himself to convey these words. If you are the chief traditionalist, where are you in the hierarchy? At the top. And you are deigning to explain yourself to other people. Oh, you people. Hmm. It beginneth to grow light in the east. How is it going? What jumps out there immediately? Oh, I don't know, but I can't read the word beginneth without giggling. Is beginneth even a word these days? No. You might find it in very old English. I think John Milton, the English poet, was really the last one to use it. It sounds pompous. It sounds old-fashioned. Sounds stodgy. Now, this translation was made just a few years ago. John Milton did not write this translation. So why use the word beginneth? Because you're trying to make a point that... Because he's trying to lower himself when he's saying that he needs the word beginneth instead of beginneth. He's using the word... Be, well, the poet... Hmm. The text, let me keep this as 
as specific as possible. The text uses the word beginneth to characterize the figure of the chief traditionalist. A chief traditionalist is somebody who holds on to tradition. And the tradition of old timey language is always with us. So again, this concern with language, with words, with their absurdity as keeping them uh, as always meaning the same thing. It beginneth to grow light in the east. Growing light in the east. Hmm, what does that mean? Yeah, and I love that you use the word literally. The words on the page mean that, yes, the sun is rising. Very good. But what does that mean in a more slightly abstracted sense? Time is passing. A concern with time. Time. A uh, little philosophical uh, paradox for you here. Is time real? Is time natural? Or is time an invention of humanity because they wanted to know what time to meet for lunch? The chief traditionalist believes in time. The chief traditionalist believes in human culture. Basing it off nature, but focusing on that rigid social purpose of it. He's not saying, oh, what a beautiful sunrise. He's saying, growing light in the east, that means time's a-wasting. What are we doing? Progress! How's it going, in his phrase? We need to be doing something. Checking up. Have you made progress? Are you on the right track? Are we making, are we finding our way forward? What's going on? What's happening? He's every nagging boss you will ever have in your life. The subordinate traditionalist responded, I haven't got the skirt and the jacket off yet, but there's a pearl in its mouth. What the hell does that mean? I don't know. I can sit there and read that for days on end, and I have no idea. He seems to know very specifically. And the chief traditionalist seems to understand it too. So between the two of them, in their society, they have an understanding of what this means. But seen objectively, it's just a lot of details that don't seem to mean anything. Hmm. Words. Social conventions. Meaning. That's almost like what they've been talking about throughout. How could that be? That's crazy. Going over the same points again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. Ah. The high traditionalist. Verily, it is even as the poems say. Verily, like beginneth. An old-timey word I would not expect in anybody's mouth these days. These days, rather. Uh, if you write me a term paper with the word verily in it, I might chuckle a little. But I'm also going to say, you know, get off your high horse. It's not a word that means anything anymore. It has lost its significance. And if you use the word verily, verily in conversation people will not take it for what the word means but they will say okay what's really communicated here is that you not you but you are a pompous ass that's what that word means now 
because to use it conveys its own meaning completely divorced from what the word itself originally meant because the word has outlived its meaning. Verily, it is even as the poems say. Notice how, again, the chief traditionalist, lover of tradition, inheritor and promoter of that tradition, leans on tradition. Somebody who's always quoting, trying to find stability and purpose and meaning in something outside of himself. Green, green groweth grain upon the slopes of the mound. The man ungenerous alive in death, his mouth will hold no pearl. <laughs> and if you read the uh, little uh, uh, footnote at the bottom, it says that this poem uh, is, is, is not to be found in all of the many, 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 many poems that comprise the classic of poetry that is supposedly quoting. So the general agreement among scholars is that this is a parody. This is them just trying to come up with, okay, how can we write a poem that sounds really profound, but is really total bullshit from start to finish? But this is what the chief traditionalist is citing, is quoting, saying this is meaningful. <laughs> And it's crap. I'll grab the whiskers and pull down the beard. You take a metal bar, break through its, his cheeks, and slowly part his jaws, but don't damage the pearl in his mouth. Again, I don't know what the hell is going on here. I don't know what they're trying to do. This uh, chief traditionalist and his disciple. But suddenly... It looks pretty violent. And it looks pretty violent on something that is alive. Grab the whiskers, pull down the beard, break through his cheeks. Now, without going off on a little uh, yarn about animal torture, which is clearly what this is, uh, the chief traditionalist is coercing nature. Whatever this animal is, or a human being, it's a little vague, whatever this creature is, it's being violently coerced to do something. This symbol of nature is being coerced by humanity by human culture human culture humanity is trying to be more powerful than nature itself so it doesn't matter what the hell is going on here it doesn't matter if they're doing medical experiments for you know developing i i, I don't know new new makeup or whatever it is animal products are tested on these days um, but it's this idea of physical coercion this idea of humanity uh, putting itself above more powerful than nature now this is a joke this is a parody the bit with the poem is funny. The little lines of dialogue where the chief traditionalist is using beginneth and verily and all of these words that if somebody were to use them today, you would have to stifle a laugh. So it is funny. But underneath it, there is that impulse. You can see the criticism. You can see the complications that come when you start to map this basic dynamic onto a larger scale. When you start to take the core of the words, leave the words behind, and find the meaning within it that can be applied to anything. That is 
the most dangerous aspect of any work of literature when you can start to look at it outside of its own narrow frame of reference. That is what we do here. We try and look at a variety of literatures and see, well, okay, everything about its time and place is nice, it's trivia, but what does it really mean to me and how can I use it to understand my world today? from that objectified standpoint. And that itself is the process being reviewed here. Leaving, taking in the words, then leaving the words behind and drawing the truth out of them for a new and fresh perspective yourself. Leaving behind the traditional values that you have inherited or that have been pressed upon you and finding your own way forward. That's what the ancient era is especially good at providing, giving us ways of looking at the world around us today from a different perspective. If you read stuff written today, uh, it's harder to get that same perspective, you know? For the last couple of decades, there's been a real boom in book sales for memoirs and people writing their truth, speaking their truth in very individualized, personal ways. And there's a real place for that in society and in culture, but it is also very difficult to use that in any way for yourself. You can you know, emotionally connect with the person, you can empathize, you can sympathize, you can try and draw lessons, but it's always so individualized that it's hard to reach that. But from this perspective, where it is so old, so ancient, so removed from our daily experience, it's just easier to get a, a handle on it. We can much more easily strip out the words and chuck them aside like old husks and just deal with what they're offering, what is the truth embedded within them. And that's all this wants. And it's funny too, if you can let yourself get the jokes. 